So welcome to this tutorial which is going to look how to create a sort of collapsing boxes effect in Houdini. Um, before we go any further, let's uh, have a look at the video of the finished effect. So we can see this is the effect uh, that we were just watching. So let me go through it part by part. What we start off with is this box. I'll dive inside. Just press spacebar G to zoom in. So this is a perfectly standard primitive box uh, which I have grouped uh, the edges of. And I've grouped uh, the edges, this is this has actually got a number of divisions you can see it's got, uh, let's go into wireframe, uh, it's got a division down the middle here, but I can group the outer edges by using the edges tab of the group node and enabling an edge angle selector. And what this is going to do is it's going to only select those edges which have a sharp angle between the different faces. So it selects these outside ones and then we simply poly bevel them. And then I've applied a UV flatten to give us some UV coordinates. Let me press spacebar 5 and we can have a look at those. Back spacebar 1 to get back to the perspective view. And then all I'm doing is selecting different groups of points that I'm going to use later on in the animations. So we've got the top points in the plus X direction, uh, the bottom points in the X direction, the top in the negative X direction, the bottom in the negative X direction, and so on. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are a range of different points. So basically every set of, every point on this object is part of one or other of these groups. And I've done that because I'm going to create various different animations which will collapse the box down to nothing. And what I'm doing is I'm doing those in these different nodes here. There are actually five different versions. I'm just going to have a look at one of them. Uh, the others are all more or less the same. Uh, obviously the animation is slightly different, but uh, they're more or less the same. And the animation for the boxes is all over 120 frames. And what we're doing is just object merging in that box that we just looked at. and the starting point for each of these uh, animations is that original box. And then we're applying different transforms which do different things. So here this one, for example, takes those outer edges down over the first 24 frames. Uh, and then the second transform takes the middle bit down up to frame 48. Uh, the next transform takes the middle bit down to the, the bottom. This transform, I imagine, takes those down. And then every single one of them add up, end up with a final transform, which goes up to frame 120 and flattens the scale in the y direction right down to zero. So we can see it goes down to a flat sheet. So we can have a look at one more of these just to show you what it looks like. So this is just uh, a very similar animation. It's doing something very slightly different over those 120 frames. And as I say, I've got five different versions of this that I've created. Well, the next thing we need is a shape uh, to determine how our boxes will look in the initial layout. And there are two parts to this. The first is uh, this base shape. Let me just zoom out, which could be anything. I've just created this, this random shape here to give us an interesting group of boxes at the beginning. Notice that the shape is closed, so we've got a bottom on it here. And the reason that's important is because we're going to use it in a minute to select points which are inside this object. So this is our initial shape, which I've called the base shape. And the other thing we need is this thing called the starting mesh. And let me start from the top of this. So we just start off with a grid. And then we're using a poly extrude to extrude it up by the same distance as it is wide. So we get this cube and by the same number of divisions as we have at the bottom. So it's, it's all symmetrical. 
And you'll notice if you can see here on the wireframe that we've actually got some detail inside this extruded object. That's because we're excluding the individual elements. If this is connected components, you can see all you get is the outside of the box. By the way, I've also ensured that we're outputting the back of our extrusion as well as the front, which gives you a solid shape. So we want this on individual elements, which gives us all this interior detail, and that's very important later for reasons uh, that we'll discuss. And then we need, because it's individual components, we need to fuse that all together. And then I'm using a group node. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that object that I prepared earlier, attaching it to the second component of the group node, and then on the group node, uh, on the bounding box, everything else is disabled, but I've enabled bounding and bounding object, and I'm making sure that I'm selecting points. And this is going to select all of the points that are inside this weird shape. Uh, and then the other thing I'm doing is just selecting all of the points at the bottom here, because I want there to be a full range of blocks at the bottom. And then I blast all of the points in those that aren't in those two groups. And you can see we get this weird geometry where we've got sort of connected lines and points, but they're forming this, this odd shape. And that's fine, we're not going to use this shape, but it's going to be useful later on because it gives us information about the adjacent points to the ones we're looking at. And then I'm just blasting a few more individual points to make it a bit more interesting. And I did that just by selecting uh, the points like so, whoops. Selecting the points and then hitting delete. Uh, and that deletes them. So that's how I deleted those last two points. So we've now got uh, our starting mesh, as we've called it. And what we're going to do is we're going to instance blocks onto each of the points on this mesh. And that's going to produce our initial setup. Uh, but we're also going to need to know where the blocks are collapsing and where they're still not collapsing. And that's where the, the difficulty or the complexity comes in this screen. So all the work uh, in this effect is going on in the instanced boxes node. Let me enlarge this. And it has two halves leading into this copy shop. So the right-hand half here is creating attributes on the points of that structure that we just created, which allow the copy shop to do some copy stamping, and which allows this other half of the network to manipulate uh, the incoming boxes so that they are collapsing that they're or not, that they're pointing in the right direction, that the right frame of the animation is being shown, and so on and so on. So we'll go through that in detail later, but essentially the first switch up here is determining which of the different collapse versions we're using. This randomizes the rotation about the y-axis, giving it a bit of variety. This time shifts to ensure that we're getting the right frame of the animation. We add some normals. And then this is transforming that animation. If you remember, all of the animations have the y-axis pointing upwards and the thing collapses downwards uh, down the y-axis. And we obviously want it pointing in different directions, collapsing along the x-axis, the z-axis, and so on. Uh, we vary the attributes of the UVs for each box. And we'll talk about shading in a, in a separate tutorial. And then finally, we scale it down or up to make sure it looks right. And I've cached all this. This, this instancing using the copy shop is actually quite a slow process. So once I've got it looking as I want, I've file cached it out so that we can see, uh, we, can, we can be more efficient about storing it. So let's have a look at this side of the network first. So we've got the object merge, uh, which just brings in that weird sort of spiky object that we had earlier. And then on the points, I'm setting up some attributes. And let's have a look at these. So the state attribute is going to tell you whether the box is intact, whether it's waiting uh, for a certain fixed period before starting to collapse, 
it tells you uh, also whether it's in the process of collapsing and whether it's finished collapsing and you can see I've listed the different states here. The delay uh, that we're giving a random value here with a maximum amount of 0.4 seconds is the amount of delay there'll be before the collapse starts. So we're going to use an algorithm to determine whether a, a box should start collapsing but we add a random delay which gives it a a more random and organic feel so it doesn't immediately start collapsing it waits for a certain random period. Uh, the collapse type determines which of those five different options uh, and you can see I've set the number of collapse types here to five which of those five uh, different options is going to be used for this particular block this is running over each of the points so there's going to be a block instance on each point and the attributes that we put on the point are going to determine how the block collapses. Uh, the collapse direction is probably the most complicated part of this uh, network, and we'll come on to that more in a minute. This simply tells you in which direction it's going to uh, collapse. So I've arbitrarily chosen uh, 0 to mean the positive x-axis, 1 to mean the negative x-axis, 2 to mean the positive y-axis, 3 means the negative y-axis, 4 means the positive z-axis, 5 means the negative z-axis. So this will store which direction it's going to collapse in. The anim time just tells you if it started collapsing, what time it is in that sequence of, of collapsing in the animation, where you are in that animation of 120 frames. Uh, this is a time, not a frame number. The anim speed tells you how fast that animation is going to be uh, played. And you can see I make each box have a random speed so it's going to be somewhere between 0.8 times the, the basic animation speed and 1.2 times the basic animation speed. The Y rotation is simply going to anim uh, rotate that box around the Y axis by either minus 90, 0 or plus 90 and it just gives it that extra bit of randomness. And then we finally we have a seed which we're going to use in a couple of the uh, a couple of the random uh, nodes later on, which is just the point number. And in each case, we're just using our old friend FIT01 with the random link to the point number. This means that each point will get a different value for these various things. And we can see that if we go onto the geometry spreadsheet, and we can see that each has a different animation speed. The anim time is all zero. The collapse steer is always the same. And the collapse type, we can see we get zero to four. The delay tells you how long it's going to wait before the collapse animation starts. Seed state is all zero to start with. Rotation, as you can see, 0, 90, uh, minus 90. And I'm just giving them a random color value, which is going to be used in the shading according to this ramp. And I'm basing that on an attribute. Uh, which tribute am I using? Which I think that isn't working properly at the moment. Let's disable that. And then uh, we're selecting a few points which uh, we're going to use to start our animation, start our collapse. So initially, the boxes on these two points will be the ones that start to collapse. So we select those points and then we set the state to 1. And that means that they're waiting to collapse. And we'll see what that means in a second. And then almost all the work is in fact happening inside this solver node. And if you remember uh, what a solver node does, let me turn off this, what a solver node does is it takes some geometry in here. And then every frame, it doesn't retake the geometry from here, it feeds the geometry back rather like you would get in a dot network. So it's not taking, it takes this geometry in the first frame, but thereafter what you're getting every frame is the result of whatever you did in the last frame. And that allows us to do this sort of collapsing and deletion of points and so on. So let's have a look at that and enlarge this. We've got four different attribute wrangles here. You could do this all in a single attribute wrangle. It just seemed to me clearer if we split them up. And I'm going to go through these in detail, 
this is where the really sort of difficult stuff is happening. So let's do a little bit of explanation of, of what's going on. So, as I said, when a block enters the state 1, uh, what happens is you take that delay, and which is a, a random time up to 0 0.4, and at each frame you take away the time step. So at some point uh, that will cease to be positive, it will go down to a negative number. Uh, and you test at every frame whether it's less than uh, zero. And if it's less than zero, uh, then you set the state to two. And two means it's actually collapsing. And at that point, your anim time comes into play. So obviously, you start with the anim time at zero. And then at each frame, when it's in state two, you're going to add in uh, the time ink. The time ink is the amount of time between each frame, the amount of time that each frame takes, which means your animation will progress. And at a certain point, the animation will reach the end of the 120 frames, and you then move into state 3, which means it's fully collapsed. So let's have a look at what that looks like in VEX, in these wrangles. So uh, let me have a look first of all at this. Now, in fact, this particular one is being used to create a sound file, uh, the sound that you heard on that animation. And I'm not going to cover that in this tutorial, but I will cover it in a later tutorial, so we'll ignore that for the moment. And then we've got this one, this is called Advanced Animation. And we can see that if the state is 2, in other words, we're in the process of collapsing, then we uh, take the anim time and we add in the time increment. That's the time that a single frame takes. Uh, and then we time it by the anim speed, which, as you remember, was the random amount that was allocated to each point. So it's the animation will go slightly slower or slightly faster on each uh, point. And then we've got an overall multiplier here, which speeds everything up. And I've actually got this set very high at 10, which means that animation of 120 frames is actually going to take about 12 or 15 frames to finish. And then if the animation time is greater than the animation length times the time increment, in other words, this, this is going to give you the number of frames uh, times the time increment. So if it's greater than 120 frames times the time increment means that we've got to the end of animation, we set the state to 3, and we set this detail attribute, which is to do with the sound, which I'm not going to cover in this tutorial. So that's just doing the animation. This next one is really very complicated, and it's quite a lot of code. Uh, and let's start with an explanation. So we had that structure, you'll remember, which had points connected to their neighbors by lines. And we want to have those lines because uh, there's a function in VEX which allows us to look at the points which are connected by lines to the, to the current point. And this is going to enable us to do two things. First of all, at each frame we're going to check for this point whether any of its neighbors are in state 3. In other words, if they have fully collapsed. And if they've fully collapsed, if any of them have fully collapsed, then this uh, point will move from state 0 to state 1. In other words, it'll start waiting for that delay to be finished, and then it'll start collapsing itself. So that's how we get the different blocks to sort of gradually start collapsing as each one finishes. But this is also useful because uh, the other thing we don't know in general, is which direction the block should collapse in. If I've got two blocks next to each other, like this, and this one here is going to collapse, uh, what can I do? Well, it can collapse in this direction, or this direction, possibly that direction. The one direction we don't want it to collapse in is this one. Is this one that's next to this block that's still solid, because that would be a bit odd. Uh, 
collapsing in that direction. You want it to collapse from one of these directions where it has an open face. And indeed, the best possible thing is for it to collapse from an open face to one where there's a block adjacent. So in this particular example, if it was only next to this box, uh, the best direction would be this one. That would be the most natural. This would collapse in towards the end of the, the, the face of that one. And that looks good. What you want to try and avoid is where you end up with a single sort of freestanding polygon because the block on the other side has disappeared. You can't always, uh, you can't always guarantee that, but uh, this algorithm does something uh, to help you. So this algorithm that's going to find the, the best direction, it's going to look at each of the neighboring points to this one we're interested in, and it'll see whether there's a block which is in a state less than three. And less than three means it's either in the process of collapsing uh, or it's not started collapsing yet. In other words, there's a solid block there. And we are checking uh, these directions that are going in a straight line. Uh, you'll remember that, that object that we had had some diagonals. And we've got to be a bit careful about those because they are actually connecting points that we're interested in. We're only interested in the points that are in straight cardinal directions away from the point we're interested in because the boxes are obviously next to each other in the straight direction. Those are the ones we're interested in. So what we're going to do is we're going to check each neighbor and we're going to compare the neighbors to the set of directions. 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, and so on. And if there's a block there, and the block hasn't collapsed, then we're going to set a, a, f a flag in an array of six directions. And the six directions, if you remember, plus x, minus x, plus y, minus y, plus z, minus z. So if you find a block here at the plus 1 direction, then this will get a 1. If there isn't one in the minus x direction, then this will get a 0, and so on. So what we end up with is uh, an array which looks something maybe like this, for example. So we have to choose a, a direction for our collapse where we've got a block behind the direction we want to go in, but not one in front. So in this particular case, this direction, the negative x direction, would be fine. Uh, because in the negative x direction, sorry, the uh, let's let's put this block the other way around. Let's collapse it from that direction. So in this case, this would find a block in the positive x direction. This would be one. But there isn't a block in the negative x direction, so we can collapse from this side inwards. And to make it slightly more complex, uh, rather than just starting at the beginning and seeing the first case in which we have a block on one side and not on the other, and choosing that as our direction, uh, what I do is in fact start at a random position in here, have a look, and then loop around until we find a position that works, and then set that as our result. So that probably sounds very complicated, so let's have a look at it in the VEX code. So the first thing we're doing is getting a list of all the point numbers of the neighbors, and the neighbors are the points that are connected to the point we're looking at by an edge. And then we're only going to do anything if our box is in state zero, so it hasn't started to collapse. And we go through each neighboring point, and we just collect the state attribute. Uh, and if we find the state attribute, and it is 3, then we set this found flag to 1. And if we've found a nearby box that has the state of 3, then we need, to, we need to start collapsing this box. So we move the state to 1. That means it starts with that delay, which will eventually lead to the start of collapse. And then we set up this array, which are the list of directions in which there is an intact box. And then we go through each of the neighbors again, and we collect the position of the neighbor, and then we create a direction vector from the current point to the position of the neighbor, and we normalize it. And the normalization means that it always has a length of 1. 
uh, and then we get the state of that uh, neighbor. And if the state of the neighbor is less than three, it means that the block is still there. It's either completely intact or it's during the process of collapsing. And then we compare this direction to all of the possible directions and simply set the relevant part of that array to one if we find a block in that particular direction. So the second part of this is going to choose from all of those possible directions which direction we're going to collapse in. Uh, and we start by choosing a random position between 0 and 5. We start somewhere in that array which has six elements. So we start with a direction and we say uh, for each, and we're going to eventually go through all of the directions, if that particular direction is 1, if there's a block there, uh, then uh, we check the opposite direction. And if there isn't a block in the opposite direction, then we set the direction to that position in the array. For example, let's assume that we started off at position 0 in the array and that actually there was a block there. So this would be true. And then we have a look at the minus x direction and say, is there a block there? And the answer perhaps is that there isn't a block there, in which case we say, great, we'll use that as a direction for collapse. And we set the done flag to 1, which means we don't have to go through this anymore. If, however, we don't find all of that, then we increase the count, we increase the start. If the start is greater, if we're going beyond the edge of the array, then we go back to the beginning. So it's just a little bit more complicated than perhaps uh, the basic, because I wanted to choose a random direction. There may be, for example, three different directions in which the collapse could happen, and we just want to choose one of them at random, which is why we start in a random position in this array. And then if uh, the direction is uh, set, then we put the collapse direct direction to that. And so the final node here is simply dealing with the time increment. So we can see if the state is 1, which means that we're waiting, then we take away from the delay a single frame's worth of time. And if the delay gets to 0, then we change the state to 2, which means that the active animation of collapse is going to be underway. And then we set a detailed attribute, which we're not going to cover at the moment. So that's the part of the operation, and it gives us the attributes on these points, uh, which will allow us to instance the boxes. So the first thing we do is we look at all of the points that have a state of 3, and then we set them to be in the to delete group. And then we're just going to delete the to delete group. At the moment, that's not going to this first frame. There's nothing being deleted. But if I increase the frame, you can see that there are points being deleted. So let's have a look at the copy sop. This will take a moment to update. Oh, it seems to be cached, so we're all right. So let's have a look at the copy sop. The copy shop is uh, just copying a box to every point, but it's using copy stamping. And new in Houdini, Houdini 15, I think it's 15, instead of specifying here all of the variables, you can just name attributes in this list, and all of them will be turned into stampable attributes. Uh, and I think in this case, uh, we've got the collapse type, the anim time, the collapse direction, the y rotation, and a random seed. And let's have a look at what that's doing. So right at the top here, uh, we're bringing in all of those different collapse animations. And the first thing we do is we're going to choose using a switch which of those animations we're going for. And so this switch has a stamp input. Uh, and what it's just doing is it's taking the collapse type and it's using that for the switch. So this whole network here on the left hand side is going to be evaluated for every point uh, that we're instancing to.
and it's going to produce different geometry for every uh, point in every frame depending on the attributes on that point. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to grab one of these different collapse types. Now of course all of them start uh, from the position that it's a solid box so while the collapse hasn't started we just get the solid box. The second thing we do is transform the box around the y-axis by either 0, 90 or minus 90 and that's just giving us a random rotation by 90 degrees which gives a little bit more variety. Now the next thing is a time shift node and what a time shift node allows you to do is to take a time and work out that everything above this node is going to be evaluated not at the current time or the current frame but at whatever this parameter here says. So in this case we're using a stamp node, uh, a stamp function again. So it's looking at the copy node, and it's seeing what's the anim time stamp value on the current point, and it's looking at that frame. So for all of the points which haven't yet entered the collapsing animation, this is going to evaluate to zero. We're just going to get a solid box. After the animation has started, this will evaluate to the particular time that we want uh, the stage of animation of that box and so we're going to get the collapse. Uh, we're just then sorting out some normals so that they, they look good and then uh, we have the different transformations. So each of these transformations is transforming the box so that it faces in the right direction for the particular direction we've chosen for the collapse direction. So the positive x-axis, the minus x-axis, the positive y-axis is of course the default which we we constructed our animations to use so we don't need to do anything for that one. Then the y minus axis, the plus and minus z-axis and again we've got a switch with a stamp that's just taking that collapse direction and using it to choose which of these transform ver versions of our box are going to come in. Then we randomize the UVs, I'm not going to talk about that today. And then we just tweak the scale so that all our boxes fit together rather nicely. And then we get this. And if I go to say frame 48, it'll take a moment to evaluate because it's, it's doing all of the stamping work. And eventually, there we are, we'll see uh, I think that uh, any of those boxes at the top collapsing? Uh, not yet. But eventually these boxes will also collapse. Yes, at frame 50 you can see this box here has started to collapse and so has this one. So uh, then I'm just caching out all of the results of this so that I can then read it back more efficiently later on. So I hope that's been a reasonably clear summary of how the basic animation here is working to create the effect of the collapsing boxes. I'll do two further tutorials based on this scene file, one of which will look at the shading and the other one will look at how I created uh, the soundtrack that goes with the animation which has sounds linked to the collapse of the boxes and that's a, an interesting look at how you can use chops to synchronize sounds to moments in your animation.